afternoon and good morning and good morning as is, is a nice thing to say for our colleagues joining us from Canada today and welcome to our pop-up ecosystem uh, featuring the best of what is available within Canada and across in Europe um, to target isolation. My name is Andy Bleeden, I'm the Director for Ecosystems and Membership for the European Connected Health Alliance. Just tell you a little bit about this, for those people who have not been involved with us before uh, and not been to one of our ecosystems, who we are. The European Connected Health Alliance are a not-for-profit organisation, but a member organisation. And our membership includes uh, many companies, policy makers, researchers, health and social care professionals, patients insurance groups, and also other voluntary groups and patient groups as well. We're a member organization with well over 750 now member organizations from across the globe, all of whom target and focus around the world, health and social care. We have a larger database and, and, and reach to over 16 and a half thousand people. Uh, and that's across 78 countries and a population coverage of 4.6 billion people. We're involved with a number of initiatives and projects. And the one that will probably interest you most today is that of our ecosystems, uh, which we have now. We have over 45 ecosystems across, uh, across the globe. And they traditionally will meet um, very, very often. And I'll talk, tell you some more about our ecosystems in a moment. But just in terms of us as a member, member organization, being involved with the European Connected Health Alliance um, brings lots of opportunities to both boost your network, make connections, and start connecting up the dots. And today's a good example of doing that as we start to connect up the dots between our ecosystems and our members across both Europe and Canada. One of the benefits as well of joining us as a member is to receive a, a, a regular updates and newsletter items around collaboration and funding opportunities, which we know are vital for people to maintain their daily running costs. But our main focus today is our, is our what we class as our, our product, um, and that is our ecosystems. For those people who, and I'm, I'm sure some of you are already aware of this, so those people who aren't aware of our health ecosystems are, these are multi-stakeholder, permanent, geographical gatherings, bringing together all of the stakeholders you can see in the diagram in front of you. And it's no, no accident that that diagram contains citizens and patients at the centre. Our ecosystems are there primarily to break down silos that exist in health and social care, also to transform healthcare and social care delivery, but importantly around creating economic growth. So we're very, very welcome of both public, not-for-profit and private sector collectively in those ecosystems. Typically those ecosystems are gatherings, face-to-face -face gatherings, and because of the current pandemic and the emergency we're facing, these need to be online and virtual. And so we've been building up a program, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, of, of pop-up ecosystems to meet that challenge. Our ecosystem network is growing and has grown exponentially over the last two years, especially so in these last few months as people realize the benefits of collaboration globally on what is a global issue and a global pandemic. We've recently seen openings of, of ecosystems in both Argentina, Lithuania, and I'm proud today, and you'll see yourselves down in the bottom right-hand corner, we'll see some news about openings in, in the Quebec region in Canada as well. But that, that's a global reach for our ecosystem network, and it's very important as it enables people to collaborate to co collectively across the globe. But as I said, for now, these ecosystems we've been putting up online still to enable our our partners to collaborate together. And we've got a program now we're building and developing, which you can see in front of you now. Building up a program over the, for basically for the last part of summer, but then we hope then to be kicking off, because we don't think, and we're predicting, that we are not going to be seeing a lot of face-to-face -face conferences between now and the end of the year, with some exceptions. And you'll see those on our website and our news. And you can see the different, as we're building that program, the different areas we're focusing, whether it's, whether it's to do with India, um, or Australia as we um, make connections there with our members, 
or we revisit other areas we've targeted before, such as mental health, which we know is of vital uh, importance to just about every one of our ecosystems and our members. We're also building and growing our community in Latin America, and we'll be seeing events for our ecosystems there as they approach their winter period, uh, which is coming up shortly. Added to that, we're, we're looking to go back to Greece, uh, where we've had an involvement for a very long time, and look at the area of telemedicine. Telemedicine is another area which we can run and run throughout our ecosystem network, um, both in Greece and also in some of our other ecosystems that are very interested in this area. We will be planning, and already I'm, I'm, we'll be um, highlighting today, planning our next event involving Canada and Europe uh, around uh, isolation again, but with a very, very different perspective, and uh, we'll talk about that later. And then we're, we're, we're organising some geographical based ecosystems for the Highlands and Islands in Lithuania, and we hope early in the autumn or fall uh, to be focusing in back into Northern Ireland as well. But today we're looking at the subject of isolation. There's not a day seems to go by when our news and our news feeds talk about the growing risk of isolation during COVID times. And there's usually a lot of negative images, um, some of which I post up here, which all seem to be having pictures of people looking out the window with masks on. Um, very negative images, usually lots of stereotypes. But behind that lies a real, real understanding of a growth of issues around people who are experiencing isolation, either worsened uh, because of COVID or for the first time because of quarantine or lockdown in different countries and regions. So I'm pleased to say we've got a great um, set of panelists for today. Uh, you can see in front of you, and we've invited what we hope to be an exciting group of people to speak, both from Canada and Europe, and show some of the ways in which we can collaborate together and break down some of those silos, transform health and social care delivery, and also then focus on creating economic opportunity. Okay, that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to our first speaker. Um, but first, I'm going to hand over to Pascal, who is our lead from Techno Montreal. Pascal, over to you. If you just introduce yourself, please. Andy, thank you and welcome, everyone. And it's uh, 7 a.m. here in Eastern Canada. So, good morning. Uh, beautiful sunny day out here coming out. So, it is a um, real pleasure. My name is Pascal Beauchamp. I am uh, advisor to the CEO of the Techno Montreal. Techno Montreal is the uh, technology uh, cluster for Greater Quebec now. The Montreal is uh, slowly getting out of techno. We're uh, in a new positioning, being now a uh, provincial uh, cluster to respond to Quebec's needs. Um, so, I am advisor. Uh, my role is um, building. Uh, strategic alliances uh, throughout these innovation ecosystems um, and one of our uh, main uh, subject themes uh, clusters within the cluster is the health digital health and aging cluster that we have been collaborating building and um, building awareness uh, to show that Quebec has a strong role uh, for over 20 years um, in aging challenges throughout our network of universities and laboratories and newly here in Quebec, uh, the Living Lab approach. So um, since 2015, uh, we've been um, bridging the gaps uh, between uh, academia, research, industry uh, to face the challenge in Quebec, uh, like throughout the world that we have with aging Quebec is a um, pole position leader, if I can say, with uh, aging demographics being in the top uh, six or seven now in the world of the acceleration of uh, the aging and changing demography. And also uh, the main challenges that uh, aging uh, faces throughout our health system. Um, our health system today um, here in Quebec, like many uh, places around the world right now is facing uh, challenging times. So our role is really to be able to bring together uh, the right experts, the right organizations, uh, to drive economic impact, of course, but to drive also social impact, to put human first and build 
uh, this ecosystem to be a strong player throughout a bigger ecosystem, which we are very, very, very happy to be a part of here with ECH Alliance as a partner. And throughout uh, sharing knowledge, we truly believe that this is a way that we can find um, answers or at least uh, bits of uh, solutions to face what we are uh, now uh, knowing today. So we are now a cluster that drives on a provincial scale. So meaning we are now entering a phase where uh, the challenges with COVID uh, are accelerating. And it is an honor to be part uh, this morning of this discussion. And we've brought along two experts, uh, two great experts and two great individuals in Mélanie Couture and Pierre-Alexandre Fournier, uh, which will uh, take uh, uh, the, uh, the stand uh, very shortly. So Andy, uh, back, to, uh, back to the program, and it's an honor to be here this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Pascal. And great news, um, as you saw, this is the, the exciting news. We've got our Quebec Digital Health Ecosystem announcement here, and I think that's, that's a really uh, important feature for today. As one of the takeaways from today so thanks for that Pascal and it's been um, an honor working with you over the last few few months now um, to build build a program and and and, and get get things moving and and, yeah. and, 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 and you persevered and that's really really good and I think there's lots of opportunities for collaboration um, between Canada and Europe there's plenty of experience of that uh, and a lot of programs have happened already and then there's hopefully today we'll see some of those links and there's we always like to say there's an opportunity to connect the dots between um, our ecosystems and today we can do that in practice. Um, so thank you very, very much for that. So you, moving on to our, 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 our next speaker, please, to, to, to Melanie, who I think has joined us now. If you turn your screen off, please now, Pascal, thank you. Uh, to Melanie. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, my voice. I'm having a problem this morning. I think it's too early. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Get this woman a, a whiskey for goodness sake. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen so I can actually uh, show a PowerPoint at the same time, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so can you see it? Yes, just make it full. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, oh, perfect. Moves too. Wonderful. Yeah, I tried something new today. <laughs> um, so the topic of my presentation today is actually the link between social isolation technology in time of COVID nineteen. Um, so there's a lot of discussion during co uh, times of COVID on how can we actually decrease social isolation because some people were actually not isolated and actually became isolated because of all the different measures we put in place for older adults and other people also during <clears throat> to prevent all the disease to uh, spread even more. Um, so Pascal wanted me to explain what it is my role actually. Uh, so I'm, I'm not a university researcher uh, or a professor. I actually teach and I have an affiliation, but I'm actually an institutional researcher. Uh, within the public social and NKR system. Uh, so which means I'm involved in different things, including um, governmental initiative and mandates. Uh, for example, during COVID, we actually, uh, there was committees of experts. So we were on the committee, we were 15 experts on the committee uh, to actually try to find how uh, are we gonna reduce the difficulties encountered by older adults and caregivers during confinement? And also, how are we gonna uh, try to slowly put people back together? <laughs> um, so I'm also specialized in social gerontology and technology and other issues. So I often have, as an audience, government, social, uh, people in the social and healthcare system, universities, organization, community organization, and also the general public. So what I'm going to present today is some of the reflection we had within that committee and also uh, within one of our research projects uh, in technology, we actually did interviews 
uh, post uh, at really at the end of confinement with older adults uh, living in a seniors residence to actually have their input on how they were experiencing uh, the confinement and all of this. So, so we do have some uh, input about technology also. Um, so just to put it in context, so what happened in Quebec, Canada, uh, in March, on March 13, there was a shutdown. Everything was closed except, of course, pharmacies and, and grocery stores. And it was, there was a recommendation that older adults should actually stay in their house and not leave. Okay. Um, so as some of them said, they were in prison. <laughs> so <laughs> in a way, because they couldn't get out. Um, so it was like that for almost two months. And then in early May, 2020, older adults had the permission, let's say from the government, to be able to get out of the house and start somewhat living again. And it was the same for senior residences. Uh, for a long-term care establishment, wasn't, um, we weren't there yet. So I, by the end of May, so some caregivers were actually allowed back into senior residences and long-term care facilities. So you have to understand that people were allowed to go out, so older adults were allowed to go out, but nobody could go into senior residences or long-term care facilities. So, so, so they could go, but nobody could come in, okay? Um, so this was to reduce the risk of contamination. So people who did not want to be contaminated could actually stay inside and not even go out and be protected from the outside world. So this is what happened with older adults uh, for, for the last few months regarding COVID-19. So the new concept kind of appeared within the social realm. So, uh, and it changed social interaction at the same time. So, there was confinement, so not being able to go out. And then there was a the concept of social distancing that was slowly replaced more by physical distancing. So social distancing meant that uh, you were supposed to keep at least two meters from people and if possible, wear a mask uh, or not even go out. Um, so social distancing, it was labeled that way, but that had somewhat of an impact because technically staying away from people, uh, like keeping two meters, it is actually more physical distancing than social distancing. So right away, it, it, it gave a, a sense of social isolation by putting the word social uh, out there by the government which like I said, later on, they started using physical distancing in, instead because people were saying it doesn't make sense to call it social distancing, even though there was social isolation because of physical distancing and confinement. Um, when we did the interviews and uh, as we talked to uh, other partners, what we found was since people were not able to go out and like go to pharmacy, get their own groceries, they had to rely on other people and older adults actually perceived that. So, so they weren't socially isolated because they were getting help, but they saw it as a loss of autonomy. They were saying that we, we, are, we only have maybe 10 years left to live. I'm in good health. I'm able to walk outside and go out. And all of that has been taken away from me. So they actually conceptualized it as a loss of autonomy, but not because of their health, but because of, COVID-19 and all the, um, the, the, and all the laws and things they had to be careful about. So when they live in, uh, in seniors' residence, they weren't allowed to go out, people couldn't come in, that somebody washed uh, the, the, the groceries that came from the outside. So there was a lot of new rules they had to buy and they, and they followed it because they fear being contaminated by and also contaminating other people at the same time. So they did abide to those new rules, but they felt a loss of autonomy, but they knew it was for their own good at the same time. So it was kind of conflicting for them. So because like they said, 
they don't have much time left, so they want to be able to do whatever they want. And now they add uh, special rules they have to follow. Some of them may, may also were facing ageism, uh, which means that people were uh, actually making decisions in their place, saying, oh no, you won't go out, it's dangerous for you. But in reality, uh, when it, in May, they could go out. It was okay. People, their people were allowed to go out. So it, it was more of a, it was supposed to be more of a personal decision whether or not you were going out rather than if you're an old person and they would see you at the grocery store, they would say, hey, you're not supposed to be here. Okay. So people were feeling that as if they were the ones that were dangerous because people say, no, you're not supposed to go out. And it was the contrary, that other people were more dangerous for older adults. But as we find out as time uh, went by, is that it's actually more, uh, in Quebec, it was more people in long-term care facilities that actually died from the disease and had a worst case scenario because of their, in, their vulnerability that was already there physically. There were some deaths uh, in uh, seniors' residence, but it was mostly in long-term care facilities. So it wasn't older adults at large, but still they were facing ageism. People were telling them what to do. So they weren't treated as adults anymore. Uh, and that was really a problem for some time. So it wasn't everybody, but like I said, there, even now we're still having problems with some of the uh, senior residences who are not letting people go out and do what they have to do. Another example is that for, um, they, they said that if you go out to a hospital, uh, then you, when you come back uh, to the senior residence, you have to be in quarantine for like two weeks. And then, but the government said if the person was hospitalized, but some of them actually said, no, if you just go for a one hour appointment, you come back, you have to be confined for two weeks. So there was misinterpretation, like in any program we do, any measures we put in, some people kind of put a twist on it in their own way. So it's really hard when the government puts out um, new ideas or new rules or recommendations uh, because some people kind of distort <laughs> what is being said and use it in a different way in a different way. So there was problem with that. Uh, like, so maybe at the beginning, I also work in the uh, older adult mistreatment. So I actually got a lot of information about those kind of cases at the same time. So people said, what about if we put in technology? So people, even though they are confined or choose to be and stay inside, uh, can actually continue to uh, maybe get food from the grocery store delivered and, and also talk to their family. And so there was a lot of talk uh, also within the committee and elsewhere about, can we just give them tablets and uh, or give them computers so they can use them and feel maybe less isolated and maybe less of a loss of autonomy and more contact with people. So we actually started thinking about looking at what could actually technology do to reduce social isolation? Well, first of all, we have to understand what is social isolation. So uh, I've put a lot of definition together here, but what's common about them is it's actually a process. So social isolation takes time to happen usually. And also it's objective and subjective at the same time. So objective means you don't have a lot of people around or people you interact with. So that kind of happen with uh, COVID and confinement. And there's also the part about the subjective evaluation also saying, well, I have a lot of friends, but none of them are real friends, for example. So it's really a process of evaluating existing relationships and ex interactions. So with COVID, uh, things change in, in their re reality, but also maybe in their mind at the same time. Um, so I'm going to give you an example. Uh, one of the residents actually said that he used to go to his neighbor's house, uh, well, apartment, to watch movies every night. Uh, so he was watching movies every night. And then when COVID happened, he couldn't do it anymore. Well, he wasn't talking to her anymore. 
<laughs> so it wasn't even picking up the phone. So it, it did change interaction and not all the interaction continued um, depending on the, the, the evaluation of the relationships. So um, it's also perceived as a lack of social support. So social isolation is also the equivalent of not having enough social support. Well, there are different kinds of social support. So emotional, informational support. So for example, someone to give you good advice about a crisis. Well, informational support with computers, you can actually go online and try to get more information about what's going on and everything. But emotional support, unless you're part of um, uh, groups or a virtual group, support group online, it's not really there. Um, so, uh, or it could actually be using uh, FaceTime to talk to your family. Uh, so there's also the part about tangible support. So someone to prepare your meals if you weren't able to do it yourself, for example. Well, there were problems there because external support could not get in, for example, um, uh, uh, seniors residents. And also even people who were who receiving home care did not want home care to come in because they were afraid they would be contaminated because they know that workers go from houses to houses and everything. So there were problems at, at this level because they weren't getting all the help they used to. And also some of the companies were actually shut down and were not functioning. Affectionate support, it's more about somebody who hugs you, uh, gives you, uh, um, so, so gives you affection. And using technology that might be a little harder because there's no physical contact, there's no presence. There's also the part about positive social interaction, someone to have a good time with, uh, to have fun. There was a big problem there because people couldn't uh, like play bridge together anymore. Uh, and also they were having negative uh, interaction with people who, who did not approve that they were not wearing a mask, that they were going out. And so so there, this part was really uh, affected uh, by COVID-19. Interaction became tense. <laughs> and there's also the connectedness part. Well, you feel connected to your family, friends, and acquaintances. Well, if you see them last, you talk to them last, you don't see them in person, it's harder to feel connected to other human beings, especially if you are confined to your room, which happens a lot in uh, seniors' residences where people were in their room and were getting their plate and their food to their room, but they could not get out and see people face to face for almost two months or even more. So all of these aspects were somewhat affected by the changes uh, brought on by COVID-19. So the idea, what about technology? How can this actually help? Well, in uh, statistics show that a lot of older adults actually have access to technology. They might have internet in their house. They, they, they have uh, maybe uh, phones, sometimes they have tablets, they have computers. Well, in confinement, what we found was that older adults were using technology, but the problem is, is that even if you have it, it doesn't mean you're gonna use it a lot. So for example, even if COVID uh, was happening out there, they still needed tech support, but this time they couldn't have someone come over and help them with their tablet and show them how to use it. So <laughs> if you're using technology in times of COVID, you have to find a way to give tech support without being there. So, uh, so you have to think about that and implement that too, which we don't always have. Um, also, they usually have older models of technology, so old tablets, old computers. So it doesn't make the experience that much enjoyable because everything is slow uh, or some of the application don't work. Uh, also, some of them have functional deficits that impede the use of technology. Uh, one of the person I interviewed said, well, I have Alexa, but because my voice is shivering sometime, Alexa doesn't understand me. So the technology also has to be improved and adapted to some functional deficit. Same things with phones. If they're too small, people can read on it. So maybe a tablet. Sometimes they use computers because it's bigger. They can actually 
put the letters uh, in, in a bigger font and actually be able to read. So if it's not adapted, then it's harder to use. Uh, also, there are privacy issues. They don't want to do online shopping usually because they're afraid that uh, something's going to happen uh, with their credit card. So this has to be uh, also explained and tell them how to choose which sites to go to. And also it's all about life habits. If they used it before COVID, they continued using it, but COVID did not make them use it more necessarily afterwards for all of these reasons. So if it's not integrated in your lifestyles, then it's not because COVID's happening that you're going to use it even more necessarily. Uh, for, for those who are already using it, then they actually used it more to do shopping and try to find information and things like that. But those who weren't using it, they did not start using it. So the idea of just giving, okay, it's COVID, and giving tablets to older adults won't necessarily work. Uh, there needs to be things put uh, in place to be able to actually uh, make it work and implement in the right way. Um, so like I said, maybe better models, uh, tech support that can do be put in place without contacts, adapted uh, technology for some functional deficit, uh, maybe security issues can be addressed also. Like I said, it's people have to use it a lot to keep using it also. What about technology to counter social isolation? Well, actually, a even if they actually, there, yeah, no problem, almost finished. So, uh, so even if there were, uh, they actually had technology, they preferred way more seeing people in person and having phone interactions also. So they would be calling people. So not using the tablet, FaceTimes and things like that. And also for the in-person part, usually it would stand on their balcony and their family would come and see them from afar. And also they don't see technology as a way of actually developing new technologies. Maybe being able to maintain existing relationship and especially if other people or other friends or family are using technology. So then they're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna use it to talk to you on FaceTime because you want to do FaceTime. Uh, so, and also sometimes it's one person plays game on the web and actually invites the older adults to join them and explain how to use it. So they have usually, they said they needed to be accompanied and uh, initiate and, integrated in a group using it to actually use it also themselves for social interaction. Um, so in conclusion, I have to say that from what I heard, from what we found also, is having access to technology does not mean older adults are going to be using them in time of COVID-19. So they're usually used as a last resort to maintain existing relationship and get social support. So they rather call and then use the web to get support. So to counter social isolation, if technologies have to be actually integrating in existing social interaction before the worldwide crisis arrives, or maybe the next wave of COVID. So it's now the time maybe, and it has to be initiated by somebody they know and is using it and using it together for it to actually work. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Melanie. Very informative. And, and, and I think, I know you can't see this, but I'm sure there's a lot of people just sitting there going, yes, that's exactly what we're seeing here. And no one thought about this. And the idea of physical and social distancing is very, very, very important and going to be quite an impactful uh, for us now. And I think now, now maybe we can bring in perhaps a, a, an idea of a potential solution. This is uh, a chance to introduce Leanne Monk, who is uh, from our one of our members, uh, Elemental, based in Northern Ireland, and they, 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 they've got some really interesting solutions, we think, that are highly scalable and replicable um, across many different countries. We've seen this before. So, Leanne, we're going to ask you to open up your screen. What I'm going to do um, is, is give you 10 minutes, and then you'll see my face appear on the screen, and you'll know it's getting near 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, <laughs> because uh, we, we hopefully got some time. So Leanne, over to you, please. Can you see my screen there okay, everyone? 
everything's fine wonderful see your Great. screen Off thank you, go. you um so good afternoon good morning everyone and as andy said my name is liam Bosgal, and i'm the co-founder and co-ceo of elemental software Elemental is best described as a tech for good company. And we like to say it's a tech for good company with a difference in the sense that there's two co-founders in the organization, Jennifer and F and I, and we're in fact not techies at all. Um, we, are, we were uh, former community development workers and we spent most of our career working across our most disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities in Northern Ireland. Um, we reached 13 years working in our most disadvantaged communities. And in the last few years of our careers as the community workers, we were growing increasingly frustrated that despite being really successful in securing funding for our communities, that the people that needed the help most were still not engaging. They were walking past the buildings that we were running, running the programs and services in. And we were really honest with ourselves and said, we need to change the way that we're working. We wanted to make sure that the person that needed the help most was at the very center um, of everything, giving them the best chance at life in their communities. What we'd also seen was that in our communities, we had our doctors, our nurses, our social workers, our OTs, our physios, that they were all trying their best equally to give people the best chance at life in their communities. And us as community workers, we were also trying our best. But the problem, the big problem that we identified was despite that everyone working so hard across our communities, we were all working in separate silos. And that meant that people were falling through the cracks and not engaging and these were the people that needed the help most. So we thought about this and we thought, could it really be as simple as having a piece of technology that acted as the middle man or the middle woman and that connected everyone up, that played a part in community development and health in the communities. And what we didn't realize at the time, what we were actually talking about was social prescribing. Hence, the elemental story began, the elemental organization was born. So what is social prescribing? In its simplest terms, social prescribing is about connecting people to programs, services, events that are happening on a person's own doorstep in their community. Programs, services and events such as a Couch to 5K program, a healthy cooking program or a mindfulness session. Social prescribing most commonly starts with a GP, a practitioner, doctor making a referral for a patient uh, and connecting them to what's commonly known as a social prescribing link worker. And that social prescribing link worker is really the linchpin in the social prescribing journey. They really help the patient to co-create their social, prescri social prescription package of community interventions and supports them along their whole journey uh, with social prescribing. So where do we come in? Elemental, we have a platform known as Elemental Core, and it's a digital platform that underpins the whole social prescribing ecosystem from start to finish in each of the communities. So just a little bit about uh, where we're at on our stage and our elemental journey. So we're the market leader in terms of social prescribing technology across the UK and Ireland. And it's a platform for choice uh, for over 268 digital social prescribing hubs. It's growing each month across England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. So, Today in this session, I wanted to share with you how some of our customers are using social prescribing to support their people that are isolated and lonely in their communities during COVID-19. So in addition to having our main platform, the customers would have Elemental Core. They also um, availed of our add-on module, which is called Elemental Self-Refer. So Elemental Self-Refer is basically an extension to a customer's own website and it allows their people, their patients and the community to refer themselves to local social prescribing hubs. And it really ticks away, especially during COVID, the reliance on the referral needing to be done through the GP within the GP practices. So what happens is once a, a person makes their own self-referral, it's done within the whatever website is nominated, it's picked up then by the local social prescribing link worker in the community, and they pick it up within Elemental Core who they will then make contact with the person by telephone. So I wanted to share with you, you can see on the screen here, um, three different types of customers that we have that are availing and still using Elemental Self-Refer throughout COVID to support their most isolated and lonely people in their communities. So you'll see here Life Rooms. Uh, so Life Rooms is a project run by an NHS mental health trust in Merseyside, England. So what they've done, 
they've attached Elemental Self Refer to their existing Life Rooms website, which was already uh, used a lot. Um, and they worked in partnership with the local GP practices to promote that to everyone in the community that self-refer self was there. And they also promoted it really well to the shielded patients and used the shielded patients list. So secondly there, we have um, One Health Lewisham. Now One Health Lewisham is a large GP confederation and it's bringing together 14, 41 GP practices right across Lewisham and, and London. And what they do, they collectively fund and run their own social prescribing program right across Lewisham. Again, they attached it to their own Lewisham website and allowed the patients right across the 41 practices to avail of the self refer service. Now, the third one here is called Care Mercy Side. And Care Mercy Side is a GP led social prescription charity and it's based in Nosley, which is an area of, in Liverpool, England. And I want to chat a wee bit in more detail about that one. Again, they attached the self refer to the existing website, but I want to just give you a, a bit more detail on their approach. So, as I said already, it's a social prescription charity. It's based in Nosley, Liverpool, in England. Nosley is a population size of around 150,000, and it's an area that ranks really high in terms of multiple deprivation measures. So, you can see here a patient's journey. Now, this would be the patient's journey um, if they're availing of the self refer option um, via Care Mercy side. So, you can see here point one how it's initiated. Um, they work in partnership with the local GP practices. The GP practices sends out bulk text messages to different cohorts of patients. So it might be pa patients with certain medical conditions, patients that are on the shielding list, etc. So they would send them out in a coordinated way. So once the text message is sent out, the patient would open up the text message and if interested, simply click on the link and it brings them straight into Elemental self refer. If they want to make the referral, they do so. And once that referral is made, it then goes to point three and it's picked up by the local social prescribing link worker. They pick that up on our main Elemental Core platform. They make contact with the patient um, and they put in an appointment for an assessment. So once that assessment happens, we're on point four and they create a baseline. So normally the, the baseline would be created and they would use different accredited tools. So this particular project, they would use a combination of GAD7, measuring anxiety, they might use the PAM score, which is measuring anxiety levels and activation levels, sorry, or they would use the WEMWEBS, general wellbeing. So those scores is taken and we really get a baseline. And based on how the patient answers uh, and their score um, on how they answered, it would bring up an elemental, a list of programs and services that they could join um, to help them throughout COVID. Um, so for example, a, um, a good, uh, commonly signed up the intervention for care emergency side was called the phone a friend telephone befriending service so that's one example of what the, the patients can sign up to as part of their social prescription package so the link worker will co-create the package with the patient and then they'll say okay you're happy with the the package i'll call them with you you know on a weekly basis i'll do a telephone call every week but then at the end of every month we'll take the baseline scores again now you're at point seven um, and you have some patients now with Uncare Emergency Side that are on the programme three months and we're starting to get evidence that the patient's anxiety levels is lower. We have that on the platform with the baseline. We've got the follow-up sessions for three months and we can be confident that they're getting the support locally in the community that they need. So that's a, a typical journey that the patient would go through using self-refer in Nosley Emergency Side. So self-refer, you could say that it's been a real success for Care Emergency Side. Just three weeks into the programme, they'd already received a massive 341 referrals by a patients referring themselves. And just to bear in mind how, how many referrals that is, the population size is, is only 150,000 for the whole area. So that's a massive number of referrals for them um, to look at. So it was a real success. And they weren't bombarded with uh, referrals either because they had a, a team geared up to take those referrals coming in. So you can see here on the screen the different reasons as to why people referred themselves during COVID. So I want to share a lovely little story with you and it's attached to one of those self-referrals that's come in. So meet Paolo. Paolo is a volunteer for the Phone a Friend service that runs in Nosley. The Phone a Friend service is one of the community interventions that the patients could be referred to as part of their social prescription package throughout COVID. So Paolo, through the service, was supporting a gentleman in the Nosley area 
who recently lost his two dogs. And because of that, he was feeling very lonely and isolated, and even more so now during COVID. So as a result of the conversations Paolo and him were having, um, Paolo offered to help him fill out and send away an adoption form. They adopted new dogs through the, do the, the dog's trust. The gentleman didn't really know how to fill out the forms, didn't have access to a printer, so Paolo supported him with all that. Um, and you can see here on the screen um, the nice little um, social media message that Care Merseyside just last week shared the great news that this gentleman, gentleman got accepted to adopt a dog and is now a proud owner of a Lakeland carrier called Reggie. So I think the story really highlights the power of social prescribing and the power of technology to better connect communities. And Care Merseyside, they've really made it really easy for that gentleman to get support during COVID by offering elemental self refer attached to their website. So I just want to finish by saying and showing that this is Care Merseyside's full social prescribing model that runs throughout Nosley. And you can see that self refer is only one part of the puzzle when it comes to bringing their overall model together. Um, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions after everyone else has presented. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Leanne. Thanks for 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 giving us. A, I think what is a really really good example of a self referral service that is scalable. Obviously, when we're in trying to do these pop up ecosystems, the idea is around connecting at some of the dots. And already, I can see ways we can connect those with colleagues in Canada um, who are managing isolation. And 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 I know social prescribing has been trialed in some places in Canada. Um, but also, um, later on, we'll be, we'll be hearing from Finland, and I know there, I think this has got very obvious links to our colleagues in Finland who, who are targeting the wellness concept um, in Helsinki and other areas. So I think it's a nice way of, of trying to connect up the dots. Now, moving swiftly on, I'd like to introduce Pierre, Pierre Alexandra, uh, who's from Hexoskin. Uh, Pierre, if you could um, share your screen, please. We should see some yes. uh, examples of uh, from from him. Ah, okay. Hello. Uh, good morning. Hello. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, let me just share my screen first. Wonderful. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. All okay. yours. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, on behalf of the Hexoskin team, uh, thank you for having me uh, today. I'm currently in Los Angeles, California. Uh, so it's five. It's almost five a.m. Um, it's good to see that the European countries are uh, getting to most of them at least are getting to managing the, this crisis uh, at the moment uh, in California and the U.S. Southwest. Uh, the crisis is still uh, very real. Uh, so today I'm, I'm going to uh, introduce you uh, very briefly to what we do at Hexaskin. Uh, in general, and then more precisely what we are, we're doing right now uh, to keep patients uh, safe at home, especially these patients who are the most vulnerable uh, to the virus, patients with uh, chronic cardiac condition and uh, pulmonary diseases, so that we can keep them at home uh, safely. So, um, so we, we're providing at Exoskin remote patient monitoring solutions for our chronic cardiac and pulmonary disease patients. Uh, and, and we believe this helps to break isolation. It helps them uh, have access to secondary prevention services, such as uh, at home uh, cardiac rehabilitation services and, and pulmonary rehabilitation services, and also post-acute care um, services. And it goes beyond just monitoring. It's also about counseling, and nutritional advice uh, and, and different kinds of advice uh, to help the patient manage their own condition, uh, either the patient or uh, their care provider or their family at home uh, that can help them uh, manage uh, their condition. And again, the, the goal at the end is to keep patients at home outside the hospital, even before the pandemic, you know, that was an important concept and it's in, even more important now to keep them in a safe environment uh, so that they can still keep managed their condition uh, but not being uh, exposed uh, to the virus. 
So the problem we've seen uh, on the design side uh, for remote patient monitoring is that most solutions were developed for providers, they were developed for hospitals, or we took solutions that were used in hospital and we tried them to push them on patients at home. For example, on the picture on the left, you see a patient with a Holter ECG monitor, and that's, that's a setup that the patient had for 24 hours. And you can see the amount of tape that the patient has. It's very uncomfortable. And um, uh, you, you cannot really imagine that the patient would comply to this uh, on a regular basis for, for years because uh, the patient has a chronic heart uh, condition. So we wanted to develop something different, something that could be used even if the patient doesn't know how to read, uh, doesn't have a lot of memory, uh, doesn't have good eyes, eyesight. So we've developed a, a smart shirt that incorporates uh, an ECG monitor, uh, a lung function monitor. So it's like a holder for the lung as well, and an activity tracker. Uh, so we have a model uh, that, that is the one you see on the screen here that doesn't look like it's for an elderly person, patient, but we also have a model with a zipper on the front that's very easy to put on even if you, you cannot lift your arms. Uh, and it's like it's like a vest with a zipper uh, on the front. So it's very easy to set up. Basically, if the patient knows how to get dressed, they, they, can't, they can use it. Uh, if they don't know how to get dressed, you really have someone that can help them, and, and it's very easy for them uh, to, to, to manage this. So the, the only thing they need to know basically is to, to, they need to know how to put on a shirt and to charge a battery uh, on a regular basis. So we've made it so it's everything's automated. All the data, data collection is automated. So even if if the patient, um, ideally the patient doesn't have to use an app uh, to collect all the data, uh, because we we found that for a lot of patients using an app, learning a new app uh, was a challenge. Uh, but we also have an app that the patient can consult because some of the patients really like looking at the data that they provide uh, to their provider and they, they like to be involved in their care more. So it's, it's always an option for the patient to have access to their own data. And we, we strongly believe that it should be the case for, for most of what's in the medical record uh, for uh, the patient and their family, uh, not only because they, they will understand more, but also because they, they, can, they can sometimes fix mistakes in, in records that can save lives. And, and we see that uh, happening all the time. Uh, we, can, we can also use the app uh, to collect data, so symptom data uh, using questionnaires, very simple questionnaires. Uh, uh, so so uh, you just have to select the, the answer. The text can be quite big on the screen, so it can be adapted so that, uh, again, people with poor eye eyesight uh, ca can use uh, th these app uh, very easily. And we find it easier and easier now to equip patient, older patient, even patients who never used a computer before, uh, with a tablet or a phone, uh, and they, they're, they, when they understand that using this gives them better access to their providers, they're very motivated to use these tools because access to healthcare services is always a challenge, even for the patients who, who, who live in a city, even for, for patients uh, who live uh, in a residence. So they, they really enjoy uh, having the option. So these solutions, uh, for patient monitoring, uh, also used for research, and they're being used by hundreds of research organizations worldwide, and many of them in Europe, in the UK, uh, in the Netherlands, France, uh, Spain, Italy, uh, Germany, Switzerland, and other countries. So we've also equipped the International Space Station uh, with a monitoring system. So they have an advanced version of what I've previ uh, previously shown you. Uh, it's been in operation for a year and a half now. Uh, and, and these are three astronauts that we've monitored so far, Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques, uh, Italian astronaut Luca Parmitano, and uh, American astronaut uh, Chris Nakar. Um, the, 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 the monitoring health in space is, is interesting um, because it, it compares in many ways to monitoring people who are aging at home uh, and it's kind of an extreme scenario. Uh, these astronauts are aging very fast. They, they're going to experience bone loss and muscle loss at about 10 times the rate uh, someone who's, uh, who's aging on earth, uh, let's say who's 70 or 80 years old. Uh, so they are being closely monitored for, for 
various reasons because of that and, and, and all the changes to their metabolism and cardiovascular uh, system, uh, for example. And it's also, it's also uh, a model for long-term, meaning six to 12 months uh, social isolation uh, because they're, they're really stuck in, in, in a can, basically in orbit for, for six months. They cannot go out. They don't have access to healthcare services. They don't have access to their families. So it's it's. I think the psychological aspects of being an astronaut are, are are underestimated by most people, and we learn a lot by working with these people about what we should be doing uh, with people who have very low mobility and are constrained uh, to a residence or to their home uh, for long periods of time. So coming back to COVID-19 now, uh, what we've seen with COVID-19 is that it's, it's been a trigger for telemedicine. Uh, I'm showing here the numbers for the US that I've borrowed for, from a webinar from the Arizona Telemedicine Program. Uh, but uh, we've seen the same thing in China, in Japan, in, in Italy, and other countries. So to cite the US numbers, uh, in April this year, uh, between 50 and 80 percent of physician encounters have been on online, and this is totally new. Usually, it's a low single-digit uh, percentage. Um, so, uh, at the beginning of the year, um, they were forecasting 36 million virtual visits, and now they're forecasting almost a billion virtual visits in the U.S. for 2020. Uh, so, it's it's a complete game changer, and because this pandemic is going to last uh, way more than two months, uh, the, we we believe a lot of these things would become uh, a permanent state of affairs on how we deliver healthcare. Uh, not, again, not only in the US and Canada, but, but in, in most of the world uh, go, moving forward. So we need better tools. That, what that means that we need better tools to deliver medicine remotely. Because right now, most of what's being done was video consultations. We've added video and phone, and we've allowed people to work that way, basically. Uh, but that's not, that's not enough. If we want to manage chronic condition, if we want to manage aging at home, at some point you need to collect symptoms data. You need to collect vital signs. If you want to renew prescription, adjust treatments, uh, do different kind of intervention, you need to be collecting data from the patient at home. Uh, and, and we need better tools to do that. Uh, we believe, well, at Exoskin, we, we are working on part of the solution, and but we're going to need a lot more ideas uh, to, to solve the problem for all the categories of patients that we need to take care of uh, at home. So for COVID-19, uh, we've been part of other um, uh, coalitions uh, in Canada, in the US, uh, in UK, uh, uh, among these, so the a coalition organized by the MITRE uh, organization in Washington, DC uh, for COVID-19 that is meeting on a bi-weekly basis online. Uh, also with the uh, Alliance for AI in Healthcare uh, based in Baltimore in the US uh, and various other local coalitions in, in, in Quebec, Canada, in the US, for example, in California, in uh, Arizona, and Texas. So we, we started a, a monitoring program uh, with Hexoskin of COVID-19 patients. And the goal really is to be able to uh, monitor recovering patients at home most patients can recover from this disease at home and should recover at home, uh, but we want to avoid the uh, failure to treat uh, 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 events where the patients are at home and the condition is degrading very rapidly. And we've seen cases where the patients were getting better and then uh, they were uh, decompensating or degrading uh, very rapidly. So we want to really avoid uh, these situations, uh, especially in times where um, we, we, have, we have peaks, um, cases, and, and, and the, the hospitals are basically overflowing, and we need to return more patients at home that we should sometimes. Uh, we want to be able to offer this option of monitoring data at home and collect data. And, and another thing, too, uh, I, th I think that's, that's very important for the long term, because now we're dealing with the first millions of patients, but we need to be to be prepared to, to deal with the next 100 million patients uh, over the next few years, is that we need to collect data for research. And when we collect data about the, the, the progression of the disease at home, uh, we, 
we collect data that will help us better design the standard of care for this disease and also to better understand how we should design uh, clinical trials for new treatments or new drugs uh, for this disease. And I think that that's very important. Uh, in, in our case, uh, in the short term, we're using uh, this data, we're collecting the, this data with the aim of developing uh, a model, an AI model to, to predict the patient trajectory. Basically, what it means is that if a patient is recover recovering at home, uh, we want to understand uh, if the patient is at risk of needing uh, ICU level uh, care in the next 48 hours so that we can, we can admit the patient uh, earlier and maybe prevent, uh, prevent a death or prevent uh, a very acute situation with that patient uh, with early treatment uh, in the hospitals. So if, if, you wanna, if you're interested in this program, if you wanna join this program, if you, you work for an hospital and you wanna provide uh, new services for remote patient monitoring, especially in, 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 uh, right now, either for COVID-19 patients or for cardiac or, or chronic cardiac or pulmonary patients, please contact us. Uh, the email address is here, contact at texascan.com. Uh, and we'll be very happy to share uh, what we've done so far and, and how, uh, we can help you set up programs uh, with our devices, but also with other devices and other tools. Uh, we're happy to um, provide advice, even if it doesn't include our technology, uh, because we've been running these, these programs for almost 10 years now. So this is an, ex an example of data that we collect uh, from patients with Exoskin. So I, I think what, what, one thing that's very important with the smart shirt that we do is that we collect um, the lung activity, so breathing rate, breathing volume, and one of the, the symptoms that's the most uh, correlated with the progression of the disease is shortness of breath. Uh, so if you can track shortness of breath in an objective manner, we believe that you, you can have a better assessment of the progression of the disease in a patient than even sometimes the patients themselves, because sometimes the patients don't feel shortness of breath. We've seen patients with an SpO2 of 50, 60 percent that were still talking to their providers. They, they didn't understand that they were breathing faster. They, they were not aware of that, uh, that, the, that their body was trying to compensate for that. Uh, and, and it's something very unique that we can measure uh, with the smart shirt in addition to cardiac activity. So again, contact us if you're interested for the next step. And, and thanks again uh, for having me and thanks again for, to the other speakers. Uh, uh, so far, it's been very interesting. Thank you very much, Pierre. Alexander. That was very interesting. I think, again, a really practical solution of something that's implement, implementable and scalable. And I think a really good um, digital tool to use in helping people who are isolated in terms of managing their health conditions. So thank you for that. What's also okay. really interesting is that's very much tied up with the and you saw the references there to the to the space um, uh, space world of space, and that's going to be the subject of our second uh, Canada Europe collaboration pop up ecosystem because we we're hoping to feature the Canadian Space Agency in that as well. So that's quite an exciting thing because obviously you can see there the real tangible need to be using tools to measure isolation and deal with it in a very isolated place and. Uh, you can't get more isolated than, than several thousand miles away from, from the UK up in space. So I'm now pr I'm very, very pleased to move on to our next next presenter, Marianne, who is from uh, Sanosti in Finland. Now, uh, Marianne comes from the Health Capital Helsinki ecosystem, which is our fantastic latest uh, ecosystem to join us from Finland. Just for those people who aren't, aren't aware of our ecosystem network, in Finland we have actually got a network of ecosystems who collaborate together and um, thankfully um, they've, they've, they've uh, introduced us to Marianne who's going to present today and I think it's a really good opportunity of, of, of showcasing how we can start to connect up the dots again between Finland where we already know we've got links between Techno Montreal and Lauria University, uh, who also are connected to the health, the health capital. So Marianne, 
Over to you. Uh, thank you, Andy. So let me share my presentation. I'm sure you can see, or I hope you can see it. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so, so I'm Marianne Danbom from Sanoste from Helsinki, Finland. And um, I will be talking about how to maintain the functional capacity among elderly during the isolation. And I will actually concentrate on the physical functional capacity because that clearly co correlates with the need of services. Well, I would like to, wait a second. Now I have problems. I cannot move my presentation. Now, oh, all right. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I would like to start with this presentation with um, two Finnish studies. The first one was made by the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, and they found out that 70% of elderly over 75 are not able to walk even half a kilometer or walk the staircase to the next floor. Well, this naturally means that they are very isolated as they can hardly participate in any activities out of their homes. Well, the second uh, recent study was done by two universities here in Finland where they interviewed elderly. And the elderly thought that in the future, when they need uh, services, they will be treated as objects without their own will. And uh, this will be the case, especially if they were suffering from memory disorders. And uh, so they thought that they would be treated as if they were not anymore alive or part of our society. And hence the conclusion of this study was that the elderly thought that they are socially dead as individuals or as a group. Now, both of these studies were conducted before COVID, and the professionals believe that the situation is much worse now. For example, there are estimates that the need for home care services will be doubled in a near future due to the deterioration of functional capacity. Now, let me briefly outline to you the landscape of the restrictions during COVID here in Finland. Now, to start with, Finland is a pretty large country with only 5.5 million people. So we did not have any general lockdowns, but naturally there was advice to keep social distancing. All the stores were open. Uh, however, restaurants and schools were closed. Uh, the government recommended uh, re remote working. And there was also a recommendation that elderly over 70 will self-isolate and refrain going from, uh, from going to shops or other places where there are other people. Uh, all group activities were forbidden and uh, especially the exercise activities that elderly typically participate in. In nursing homes, there were no visitors allowed, no recreational activities, nor communal dining. Uh, until now, we have had less than 330 people dead due to COVID, and they have mainly been old people and unfortunately many in nursing homes. There were several initiatives to make elderly to take care of, uh, to take care of their functional capacity during the self-isolation. The first thought was that this, this situation would only last for a couple of weeks. So many municipalities and organizations did self-made exercise videos and downloaded them to YouTube and thought that the elderly will, will use them. As the situation lasted, then came uh, more professionally made webinars. And then there was on TV twice a week uh, uh, exercise sessions tailored for elderly. 
And when the weather got uh, warmer, there was so-called balcony exercise where the picture is from where the instructor is in front of the house and people are able to exercise in their own balcony. Um, I have to say here that there was actually an interesting thing happening because the government had to make a statement that elderly people should go out for walks, bearing in mind the social distance. Uh, there seemed to be two groups of elderly in Finland, the so-called wild silvers, who didn't care about the self-isolation recommendations and continued living uh, and meeting other people like before. But then there was a large proportion of elderly that took the recommendations really, really seriously, and they didn't dare to go out of their homes at all. Now, some of the solution is to deliver stimulating activities for homebound elderly. The activities are delivered using video chat and they are real time. The service provider sees and hears the participants and they can communicate with the service provider. The service provider always has several participants, but as the participants do not see or hear each other, the service feels very personalized and private. We have versatilized, versatile selection of services, such as chair exercise, balance exercise, singing. Uh, the, the services uh, are purchased at online store and the activities are delivered to tablet devices or to a laptop computer. With a tablet device, the person does not have to ha does, doesn't need to have any prior IT skills as she only needs to answer the incoming call from the service provider. All the service providers are independent professionals with a long experience supplying services for elderly. So we have on board physiotherapists, music therapists, even a Samba instructor. Now the customer feedback is overwhelmingly excellent. 97% of our customers are satisfied with the activities. And this is based on user surveys done after end of session. The services are considered motivational. And as Max says, he does not dare to skip the exercise as the instructor sees him. Or Teresa states that it feels like having your personal physiotherapist in your living room. So they don't see the technology, they see the human per person doing the, the services. In nursing homes, they think that our services create a nice and social and happy atmosphere. And even residents with severe memory disorders are very comfortable with the services. There are several benefits from our services. They are scalable, and it is very cost-effective way to deliver services to uh, elderly persons' homes. Our end users comment that this increases their functional capacity. It is easier to do the daily things, cooking and cleaning, because, the, because of, the, of the functional capacity has increased. They also value the possibility to participate according to their own resources. With this, I mean that, for example, if your left side is paralyzed, you can still exercise with your right side. And this doesn't make you feel inferior as it would in a normal group exercise. It, uh, we also hear often that our services are very much waited for. Uh, Mike, 90, 98 years of age, said that our service is actually the only thing that he's looking forward to. He knew that the physiotherapist will call him every Tuesday for the chair exercise class. The service providers become their friends, so it increases the social connections and decreases the feeling of loneliness. And that we see 
increases the feeling of safety to live at home. Sanoste was established some years ago to provide joy and well-being for elderly, as we believe that everybody has the right to age with dignity. So thank you for listening. Thank you for that, Marianne. Very, very interesting to listen to. And yes, I think that idea about everybody has the right to, to age with dignity is an important one to, to close with. I just have to say, I love the quote from the person who said, I dare not skip the exercise because the instructor's watching me. It's like having your own personal sergeant major in the room. So Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so moving swiftly on. Um, thanks for that. And great input from Finland. I'm really pleased now to do what we're going to class as a double bill. Uh, because we not only have uh, input from a company based in the UK, but also uh, a linked company, very, very closely linked, with the same name, based in Canada. So we managed to hook up and connect the dots up between um, the, uh, with the Strata Health, um, both from the UK. And I'm going to hand over now to Clint to explain why. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, much appreciated. I'm uh, calling in from... Uh, uh, just uh, southeast of London in, uh, in Rochester, Kent, a typical British summer here, a little sun, a little rain and a little wind. So uh, hi to uh, everyone today and thank you. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen if I can. And I'm hoping that- Yeah, uh, you're on, you're on. Yeah. That's terrific. Well, I'll uh, briefly introduce myself, uh, Clint Schick, the uh, uh, Chief Executive of Strata UK. Uh, and I'd like to start uh, and jump right in by just uh, giving you a little bit of a brief uh, introduction to Strata Health, if I might. Um, we have a, a, a rich history in optimizing health and care transitions, uh, including mental health. We've been around for two decades. Uh, across Canada, the US, um, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and really the ethos of Strata and our focus uh, really transcends across uh, our core health, social care, and third sector care coordination. And it's the very same for mental health. It really means matching needs to available capacity downstream and then optimizing care across the health and care continuum. Just to give you a highlight of some of the areas of mental health that, that, we've, um, that we've targeted over the uh, years was uh, VHA, Vancouver Island Health Authority, um, in uh, the west side of Canada. And that was our first um, back in kind of mid-2000s, um, 2006 actually. Uh, Alberta Health Services, we've got um, a variety of things in Ontario and Quebec, and most recently, in, uh, in the northeast of England. And I will say during COVID, uh, we were a key component of a command and control center that is still active within the northeast of England. And so um, you know, pretty proud of some of those uh, deliverables within, within that space. I'll talk just briefly on uh, our first um, kind of uh, position in, in uh, automating mental health uh, and addictions and improving access through new ways of working. And it was within the Vancouver uh, Island health system. Vancouver Island is an integrated healthcare system in Western Canada with circa a uh, million people, 114 services that we mapped out and 125 bedded facilities offering uh, spaces as well for mental health and addictions. We proved uh, over a decade ago that delivering mental health across publicly funded systems can greatly enhance um, the, uh, the system's uh, efficiency and patient's outcome. Uh, we really looked at three key considerations uh, during this. So let me just highlight those briefly. One was really matching resources to patient needs. Now, this requires a pretty detailed directory of service. Uh, that needs to be then cataloged within specific clinical pathways. So uh, it really allows you to understand assets, but it gives you the capacity to judge appropriateness and get patients into the right care at the right time. But the second thing is that you need to understand capacity. So it's one thing to have kind of a Rolodex of services, and, and that's really important and not to be, uh, not to be uh, you know, 
belittled at all. Um, because if you ask you know, practicing GPs in pretty much any country, you know, how many referrals to a specific clinical care type do you have off the top of your head? They'll probably say about five or six favorites. Um, so when you look at services in the hundreds across a patch, you really do need to have that, um, that Rolodex or that directory of service. But then if you can assess capacity and understand it to mobilize patients and enable access to those services, it's really important. Um, these vacancies must be dynamically tracked. And dynamically, I, I, I really mean that it's a kind of a living, breathing process. It's one that um, is workflow-based uh, for beds, for spaces, and for appointments. What it isn't is ringing around and trying to ask facilities if they have spaces or if they can take someone or it's not a, a tracking sheet that is updated you know, on, a, on an ad hoc basis. So then the final piece is, is around uh, enhancing productivity overall and kind of uh, layering in some uh, technology and some uh, ability to kind of manage wait lists during surges. So we look at queuing theory, we look at uh, match, match rank priority. So um, understanding um, you know, if there are competing uh, clients for specific services and supply is outstripping demand, or demand rather is outstripping uh, supply, then we, we look for um, ranking and matching those uh, patients into those services appropriately, which is really, really key. Um, and then obviously the, uh, the last one would be kind of best match algorithms that, that look at um, trying to map out a scenario at any given time in real time that allows um, the, you know, the greatest proportion of patients on a waiting list to be seen appropriately in the shortest period of time. So pretty technical references relative to some of the philosophy behind what we do at Strata, but you know, really, um, uh, you're really able to, once deployed, make some significant uh, enhancements to, to productivity and flow. So, you know, within that, um, I think the UK can do more within uh, mental health. And uh, the NHS as a, as a, as a healthcare system uh, has, through their uh, long-term plan, highlighted mental health as a really key piece that, that needs to get on a, on, a, on a similar footing to physical health needs. And Strata Health as a supplier is raising our hand and saying, you know what, we can do more within, within the system as well. We've got kind of a simple diagram uh, in front of you that, that looks to um, kind of map out the process that we've got uh, in front of NHS England right now for consideration and guidance. And it looks to um, embrace technology to support, uh, you know, uh, moving patients through the system uh, better. We need to look at um, you know, both self-referral as well as professional signposting. So we've seen that uh, in earlier presentations today that that ability for patients to signpost themselves into services is really, really key. And, um, and so we, we've been able to kind of punch through the N3 firewall. And for folks that do business in, in the UK, you know, you'll know that clinical systems are, are, are held behind a firewall and very, uh, you know, rightly so for GDPR um, um, considerations. However, we need to be able to kind of link those services across. And so we've been able to do that. So that in, in, in turn then allows us to look at referrals that are triaged and, and matched to services. And we can do that either automatically uh, within the system or we can do that through clinicians uh, triaging uh, those patients. And it really is kind of down to the 80-20 rule where, where sometimes uh, some of those referrals can pass through the system uh, and, and can efficiently be processed to downstream services uh, without clinical intervention. But that actually leaves you know, more time for clinicians to handle the really difficult cases that might have multi-comorbidities and really be something that is, uh, that is uh, taking the time of clinicians to move those patients into the right type of care. As we move through that directory of service, we can look at caseload, we could look at scheduling, we could look at patient attendancies, and we're looking to uh, actually interface and integrate with um, uh, an organization, uh, attend anywhere that is actually a virtual session that can be logged. So we can actually start to see these interventions happen 
from a virtual consultation standpoint. And again, one of the previous presenters showed that you know, there was a huge amount of uptick during COVID-19 relative to that online uh, consultation, and rightly so, to keep patients and, 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 uh, and clinicians uh, safe and, and socially distanced. And then finally, the outcomes and recording those updates across and back to native systems, really key in what we do to kind of push that data not only back into native systems, but into wider repositories of population health that allows us to cross cut some of the data that we're gleaning without our system that's kind of running symbiotically with share to care records within England. And that's important because um, the, the typical EPR or, or shared care records is going to capture the who and the what and the where of uh, care interventions but we, uh, we can then start to look at some of um, the other components in terms of when and how that care intervention has occurred. So I'm gonna leave it there uh, relative to, um, you know, looking at time and, uh, and pass it back to Andy who can introduce one of my colleagues from Canada that will, uh, that will uh, give us a great uh, insight into some, some new and exciting things in Ontario. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Clinton. Great to see the impact you're taking up in the northwest of England and uh, where I'm where I'm based. And so that's uh, good to hear. And uh, thank you for your input there. Thank you. Conscious, you need to fly now. Uh, so I'm gonna, with, without any any hesitation, uh, link up then with your colleague So and Roy. Um, if you could turn on your screen, please, and uh, move over, move on to the other other part of the Strata Health input, please. Absolutely. Hopefully everything is going to work nicely. Yep. All right, I'm just going to blow up my screen. All right. Yeah, we're good to go. Good to go. Wow. This was, uh, you know, for, even for myself, listening to all the speakers, it just kind of like resonates that, you know, Canada is not alone in this. There's been, uh, this is, this COVID thing has really impacted, um, uh, you know, folks across the world and the what I'm hearing uh, you know social prescribing and uh, obviously we didn't go to space but at the same time that uh, you know the it's been pretty interesting conversation so far um, and uh, following up on uh, my colleague Clint's presentation um, we're gonna be uh, talking about mental health so my name is dr. Sylvain Roy Sylvain Roy I'm a neuropsychologist and uh, I'm currently the director of strategic initiatives at strata health um, so going to be talking about opening up access to deployment in Canada, uh, you know, the pre and post COVID scenario in Canada and in, in regards to mental health services to provide some background, um, the state of mental health care in Ontario pre COVID, um, you know, it was, you know, the, 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 the bottom line is there's a lot of work to be done. Ontario is, um, you know, Canada's second largest province in terms of population. We have four, 14 million people living in, in Ontario. Um, statistics report uh, that about 2 million Ontarians every year, um, you know, are affected by a mental health condition. And a um, significant number of them report unmet needs, so uh, up to a third. Kids can wait up to two and a half years for mental health treatment, according to you know Children's Mental Health Ontario. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, Ontario is actually trying to emulate uh, what's happening in the UK with the IAPT program and providing some psychotherapy or structured psychotherapy. Uh, right now, things are managed by our four psychiatric hospitals, and the hope is that th things are going to be deployed soon. Uh, and it's going to be more largely for mild to moderate anxiety and depression, but the bottom line is it's a step in the right direction, and we're hoping that, that you know the uptake for this is going to increase. Uh, to provide a background as well on, you know, on, on mental health in Ontario, psychological services um, is a highly privatized service in Ontario. So um, uh, we have 4,000 psychologists, an example, in the supporting about 400,000 patients each year. And to keep that in perspective, about 50% of psychologists in Ontario are private. So they have uh, clinics in the community. Um, they, you know, they, they, they support patients who can pay out of pocket or 
through extended health benefits or uh, employee benefits and so on. Psychologists here diagnose, they treat mental illness, but they also support persons with developmental disabilities and developmental conditions, acquired conditions like brain, brain injuries and uh, also neurodegenerative conditions as well. So I've, we've uh, heard a lot about functional needs uh, of the population and uh, one aspect of it is really people with dementias and so on, supporting that uh, neurocognitive aspect of it. Um, the, in Ontario as well, these psychologists are largely inaccessible in, in, in hospital schools and primary care team, um, primary, primary due to inadequate funding. So we've seen a de decrease in uh, the number of psychologists in the public systems over, year, over the years. So um, as you know, services were being cut um, in schools and hospitals, uh, psychologists basically moved from hospitals to the private sector. Um, now I'm hearing that the Ontario government is thinking of investing hundreds of millions of dollars in mental health in Ontario. Hopefully that will mean that, um, you know, more access in the public systems, but at the same time, it's going to be hard to reverse course after decades of privatization in Ontario. So, um, so to keep that in mind, navigation and wait times um, is problematic as well. Um, so uh, I've mentioned earlier that Children's Mental Health Ontario, in some areas of the province, kids can wait two and a half years for mental health services or even residential care and, and so on. Uh, mental health services are very fragmented, they're disconnected, um, and uh, once, you know, once you leave the hospital and you need to find a clinician in the community, you're pretty much left on your own to find that clinician. So you have to go on registries, you go on things like psychology today, um, you know, you try to find the right provider for yourself, but it's a really painstaking process, especially for persons with mental illness or parents who are struggling with a child with a mental illness. Uh, to try to find the appropriate provider on their own is really, um, it's painstaking. And, it, it's, and, and psychology is not unique in that. Um, physiotherapy, um, so, you know, social work, many of the services in Ontario outside of physician care uh, is, uh, is privatized. Um, and, but the bottom line is that we believe that we can actually capitalize and provide pro private providers to address the weights in the, in the system today. And this is, you know, during COVID, but also post COVID as well. And I've added a figure on the right. This is a, a survey we've done. Uh, and full disclosure, I'm also currently the past president of the Ontario Psychological Association, uh, moving out of that role. But at the time, we did a lot of surveys and we tried to figure out what was the public private sector involvements in mental health care. And we've met, we've looked at wait time and we've done the, the survey every year since and the trends have not changed. Um, with the bottom line saying that, especially with the orange bar here, um, you know, you, the bulk of providers in private practice can see you within a week or two, as opposed to, to in public sector where my, you know, wait times can be weeks, if not months to see a psychologist. And also in the public system, accessing a psychologist is really a tertiary service. It's rare that you'll see a psychologist as soon as you ask for one. You will go through trials of medications and so on before you get to the psychologist. And, um, and we have a lot of regional disparities in the province. So some areas have a lot of psychologists, others have none at all. So Toronto, pretty much the, our largest city in the province, has about half the psychologists in the province residing in the, in the geographic area. And for us, um, and now I'm speaking with both hats, uh, for the OPA and, uh, and Strata Health, we've been trying to get ahead of this for quite some time. And especially during COVID, I think that kind of lit the fire on a, a, underneath everyone to get moving. And we knew right off the bat that looking at China, looking at figures from Italy and Europe, that Canada would not be spared. And we would have to think about the mental health needs of the population sooner rather than later. Um, you know, as the public, as the public system and the governments, you know, try to ad address things like PPEs and, and protect, protective gear equipment, masks, and and so on, uh, we knew that they would struggle to kind of consider mental health needs of the population. And here we're talking about uh, primarily to begin with, physician and nurses. We're dealing in the front lines, but also all our essential workers who have a risk of exposure to the, uh, to the virus who are also stressed and anxious. And with the lockdown in Ontario, that means that schools were closed down. So parents had to stay home with their children, try to stay uh, on top of their work virtually as well. So there's a lot of turmoil that happened in Ontario. We're just starting to open up the province now, but it was a solid four months where people had to stay at home and not do anything. Grocery stores were open and I was pretty much it in pharmacies um, and there was wait, wait 
deadlines and people were anxious of going in grocery stores. And every time you went to grocery store and you talked to a clerk, you could see the anxiety. They're you know, behind plexiglass now. So it really impacted uh, Ontario and, and, and our residents pretty, um, pretty widely. Coming back to mental health, we knew that we needed something better. We needed something more. Uh, we need to utilize technology. We need to help people find the right provider at the right time. Uh, and right now, things are manual in the province. Uh, even with us, if you need a psychologist, you call, you have a psychologist, we try to find somebody. Uh, we have manual registries. Things are not automated. And with Strata Health, we recently uh, entered into partnership. So Strata Health and OP are working together to create that next evolution of, of mental health service. Uh, we'll have over a thousand psychologists in that registry that are, uh, will be well mapped out. We'll have an uh, understanding of their geography, or where they live, or what kind of service they offer, can they provide virtual care. We'll be mapping out the clinical needs and the specialties, but also we'll look at the personal preferences of the patients uh, to offer choices. So ultimately, if we can leverage the private sector, we'll be able to be in a position to reduce wait times in the public sector as well and minimize inappropriate uh, referrals. And as a uh, researcher myself, I love the idea of data and outcomes uh, and Strata Health will give us an opportunity to look at system level outcomes in terms of referral patterns and so on. That's really unique. And certainly now in Ontario, we have no idea what uh, some of the gaps could be. COVID-19 really, um, you know, with all the bad that happened with COVID-19, we had uh, so many people infected in Canada as well, not as worse as some other countries uh, like the U.S., but Canada still had an impact and many people in our uh, long-term care facilities were impacted. Um, so, but despite the negative that COVID has brought, uh, a lot of positive as, um, you know, was created out of this as well. And one of them is the partnerships and, uh, you know, the relationships that we're, you know, currently building because of COVID. Um, psychologists for the first time in Ontario are speaking actively with uh, physicians and nurse practitioners and primary care teams. Uh, we have 211, which is our call center across the province. If you, anybody needs anything in terms of referral, they call 211 and they're currently triaging for psychologists in Ontario. We have a partnership with the City of Toronto, the Canadian Red Cross, Think Research, you know, they've allowed us to go virtual in the province. So we had to go from 25% of virtual care delivery at, you know, and this data was from 2018 to almost, you know, 80% uh, within weeks in Ontario and Think Research helped us do that. And most of the psychological services in the province now are done virtually, which is a great phenomenal leap forward. But the bottom line now is that we need a strata to be the glue uh, between all these in how do we match patients to the right provider at the right time and ensuring that people can access the care they need. So a lot of good things have happened uh, through COVID. Uh, we, uh, as part of the COVID as well, we've launched new initiatives in Ontario. That's not related to government funded programs. It's really, we mobilize psychologists across the province and the private sector mostly. And we brought them together and we created, uh, or we activated our disaster response network, which has been around from, since the early 2000s. Um, and the, the bottom line is we needed a, a system where patients could call and, and, and access a psychologist quickly, especially if they're an essential worker or their families. So we went broad, people in shelters, people in um, you know, grocery stores, anybody who had now deemed an essential worker in the province can call 211 or talk to their family physician, nurse practitioner, and access a psychologist. And right now the volume's going up, which is a, a good thing in a way people are utilizing the service, but now because things are so manual within our office, this is now the time, okay, now we need to automate a lot of these things. Because if we go from you know, five, 10, 20, 30 referrals a day, to 100 referrals a day, we have to make sure that we know that we're sending people in the right queue. And you know, if somebody has a good psychologist has very little wait time in one area, let's let's you know you know divert some traffic to that psychologist just so we can actually meet the need more quickly. Because there's nothing worse than waiting for you know a week or two or a year for a psychologist. So right now our turnaround time is still 24 hours to connect to a psychologist for these essential workers, and we want to keep it that way as long as possible. And you know, this brings me to, uh, you know, the final slides. I know the time is running short and I'm trying to speed through this presentation a little bit to, to give some time for questions. Um, but the bottom line is everybody in the world needs access to the best mental health services society can provide. Uh, we have a lot of clinicians, uh, a lot of great clinicians in Canada and even in the U.S., my colleagues in the U.S. and, and, and uh, Europe as well. Uh, but a lot of us are unconnected to the healthcare system. So uh, Ontario has the private system and has the public system. They don't talk to each other. Psychiatrists and psychologists do not talk very well in Ontario. 
uh, together, which is, a, which is a shame because we do have pockets of innovation in Ontario where we have those family health teams, uh, where we have psychiatry, psychology, physicians working under the same roof, and then the innovation can spark clinical innovation and client care really is maximized that way. But at the same time, we shouldn't stop, it, this shouldn't stop, you know, the province, the, the way it's set up today shouldn't stop us from innovating as well. And especially now with the virtual care capabilities and technology, it doesn't matter if we have a psychologist in Ottawa, which is another, our, our, you know, capital of Canada, or in uh, a patient in Toronto, we can connect the dots pretty quickly now through virtual care. And if the physician is in uh, the north of the province, you know, 600, 800 kilometers away, it doesn't really matter anymore because we can connect the dots virtually. And now is the right time to kind of close that loop and if there's wait times in the public system let's see how we can navigate things uh, in the private sector as well to ensure that the patients are connected to care more quickly and and vice versa I think Strata Health has done some great innovative work in the public sector as well and is in Ontario here is a really key player for navigation from hospitals to things like palliative care and so on nothing stopping that on the Ontario government from embracing that technology as well to helping the, that public system get a little bit more uh, effective in terms of resource matching and, and referrals. But I, I digress and uh, the bottom line is we're, you know, we're working hard in, in Ontario now and I think what we've done in Ontario has uh, implications for other parts of the world and, and we're hoping that the, uh, you know, the, we're hoping the COVID will disappear. That's my frank uh, comment for the day. But at the same time, we know it's probably going to stay with us for quite some time and the mental health implications are only becoming Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And I'm conscious you were running out of time, but really appreciate your time you've taken to talk about that. And it's good to see, I think, Strata Health, uh, they're connecting up the dots both in the UK and the northwest of England and in Ontario too. So thank you for that. So and there was a quick question before you go. Um, in terms of, do you, you're obviously you're connecting up the dots there. Do you have a library of the, you know, of, of who the different players are there in, in, in Ontario? Or is that, is that something that's uh, the, for mental health in particular? Yeah. Yeah, so we are, certainly we have a lot of publicly funded agencies, like mm -hmm. uh, what we call the Canadian Mental Health Association. They're uh, an active player in the province. Mm -hmm. Children's Mental Health in Ontario, which I referred to earlier, Good. they want kind to of provide care for service and, uh, for kids. We have the school system that has its own mental health kind of system. So a lot of good players trying to talk to each other and, and try to connect to each other. But right now, yeah, they're all siloed in their own corners, and we're just starting to talk. Sounds familiar. And uh, on that note, this is this is the, the reason we're doing these pop-up ecosystems. They're an opportunity to start connecting at the dots, both locally, regionally, nationally, and, and as you can see here, internationally as well. I think as soon as we've run out of time, I'm, thanks um, to, to, to all my speakers. Firstly, for, for uh, Pascal, Melanie, uh, Pierre, uh, Marianne, Clint, Sylvain, obviously, thank you, and Leanne as well from, from, from the UK. Thank you for all those people who've taken part today and the questions we've had. I think this is a, a really, really good opportunity to show some of the best that we've got both in Europe and in Canada. And with that, I thank you and uh, wish you all well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.